This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Golem. You're too late, cackles the evil wizard. My opus is already finished. She sweeps a thick, bloody curtain from an alcove in the wall as she adds, And you're finished, too. <laughs> a massive, lumpy creature emerges, an abomination made of ill-fitting human bits, one muscular arm of dark brown flesh, the other spindly and pale. It staggers forward on a pair of mismatched legs. Its chest and head are a patchwork of different bits of flesh, thick leather cords sewing them all haphazardly together. It reeks of ozone and formaldehyde, and electricity crackles around the bolts and rods that hold its skull together. A flesh golem. Let's take a moment to give thanks to the Lord of the Rings movies. Not just because they were fantastic movies. Not just because they helped rekindle the popularity of fantasy and pop culture. But also because they finally stopped people saying Golem when they meant Gollum. After almost 30 years of being a gamer, that was really starting to drive me crazy. But put away your copy of Silmarillion and shut down Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor. We're not talking about Gollum or Smeagol. He's simple, inspired by Grendel from Beowulf, real name Smeagol. He derives from the Old English Smeagol, which means to worm yourself in. And technically, according to Tolkien, his real name was Trahald, which derived from a Middle Earthian word which meant to worm yourself in. And he just translated to Smeagol. Done. Nope. We're talking about golems. So don your kippah, your yarmulke, and let's talk Judaic mysticism. In Dungeons and Dragons, a golem is a magical construct. Basically, it's a body made of some kind of inert matter like stone or clay or iron or the flesh of dismembered body parts. That's an option. That is then magically given a semblance of life. It isn't merely an animated puppet, but it also isn't alive or intelligent. It's somewhere in between. Golems lack sentience, but they have enough awareness to follow orders and to make decisions. Golems made of iron, stone, and dismembered flesh first appeared in 1975 in the Greyhawk supplement and were created by E. Gary Gygax and Gary's first full-time employee ever at TSR, Robert J. Kuntz. He was hired to work in shipping. Basically, he was the shipping department. But the company was so small at that time that everyone got to do design work. Kuntz also had the distinction of being the first player ever to successfully complete the Tomb of Horrors with his character Robilar. See, Kuntz was something of a power gamer, and he often had private one-on-one -on -one games with Gary so he could level up his character. In addition to winning Tomb of Horrors, he also destroyed the Temple of Elemental Evil, unleashed nine different demigods and a demon queen on the world, and owned the Green Dragon Inn secretly. Gary was so angry about the ruination of his masterpiece, the Temple of Elemental Evil, that he sent an army after Robilar to wreck his castle and force him into exile. Gaming was a lot different back then. But I digress. Golems are one of those D&D &D creatures that haven't really changed much over the years. Instead, they've just spawned more and more adaptations. To this day, they are still basically just powerful magical constructs that can only be created by powerful wizards and clerics, often after they acquire a magical Golems for Dummies book. Seriously. 
In most D&D editions, there exists a collection of magical books that explain how to make golems. And that brings us to Jewish mysticism. You see, the golem is a part of Jewish folklore, and it's been around for a long time, but it hasn't always been an animated statue. The Torah mentions... Uh, hold on. If we're going to do Judaism, we've got to clarify something, because there's a little bit of a minor misconception. People think of the Bible as a joint work between Christianity and Judaism. The Old Testament is the Jewish Bible, and the New Testament is the Christian Bible. Well, that isn't quite true. The Bible is the Christian Bible. The Old Testament is based on Jewish scripture. It contains the Jewish scripture, but also a bunch of collected supplements written by the Israelites. Strictly speaking, the Jewish scripture is the Torah. The Torah is the law of God as revealed to Moses and recorded, and it is contained within the first five books of the Bible. The name Torah can also include a collection of commentaries and annotations on these first five books, as well as a number of oral traditions. The Torah mentions the word golem but once. It uses the word to mean unformed or incomplete, but it's not referring to a magical creature. It is actually referring to humanity before God invested humans with a soul. Because of the imagery of the first human being shaped out of clay and then invested with a soul, this is where the golem story really gets started. And it gets started with another word people often misunderstand. It starts with Kabbalah. Most people think the Kabbalah is a book, but actually, the word Kabbalah refers to a specific practice of Judaism, or more correctly, a way of studying the Torah. See, you could study the Torah as a literal collection of words and follow those. Or you could study them as allegory with the understanding that the stories were really about something other than what was written. Or you could study them with the understanding that it's basically all just symbolism to reveal deeper truths about the physical and spiritual universe. Or you could assume there was a deeper, hidden metaphysics revealed by the Torah. And that was Kabbalah. Originally, Kabbalah referred to a sort of practical faith, meditation, contemplation, isolation, that kind of thing. But over time, it came to refer to a different sort of mysterious inner meaning and a different sort of practical faith. In the Middle Ages, the Kabbalistic tradition became enmeshed with the study of magic. Basically, Kabbalists were clerics, practitioners of divine magic. And the most well-known Kabbalistic book is the Sefer Yitzra. The Sefer Yitzra detailed many Kabbalistic teachings, most notably the Sephiroth. And any fan of Final Fantasy will tell you that name means a collection of ten interconnected levels of spiritual consciousness through which a knowledge of the universe is revealed. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you think it meant one-winged angel or badass shirtless sexy dude with a katana? By the way, it's no accident that Final Fantasy keeps coming up whenever I talk about real-world religions. Final Fantasy has a lot to say about religion, and most of it is actually pretty unkind if you really dig. Anyway, the Sefer Yitzra, the Book of Creation, was basically a book of Jewish magic, and among other miracles, it explained how to create a golem make a body of clay or stone or whatever, and then invest it with divine life. There are actually a number of different traditional methods for giving the golem life according to folklore. One of the coolest involves inscribing three letters on its forehead. The letters Elif, Mem, 
and Tav spell Emmet, which means truth. And that brought the golem to life. To kill the golem, you erased the first letter, Aleph, and you were left with Mem and Tav, which spelled Met and meant death. Pretty cool, huh? One of the most famous golems in folklore was created by Yehuda Lowe of Prague in 1580. Yehuda Lowe, known as the Maharal, was one of the finest Jewish scholars of his time. Or any time, really. He wrote numerous treatises on education, spirituality, and law, and he turned against certain traditions by insisting children should not be religiously educated until they were intellectually mature enough to understand what they were being taught. He was also a real dude. But according to legend, he also created a golem. There was a tradition at the time called the blood libel. It was pretty horrific. Somehow, it got around amongst Christians at the time that the Jews had a tradition of kidnapping children and killing them as sacrifices in their Passover traditions. There was no truth in it. But as Christianity was gaining a lot of sway over Europe, it became a really nasty justification for the persecution of Jews. In the late 1500s, anti-Jewish sentiment was growing in Prague, and as Passover and Easter approached, it looked as if blood libel accusations were going to lead to attacks against the Jewish population. Supposedly, Yehuda Lowe created a golem to protect the Jewish people of Prague, but he later destroyed it because he could not keep it from hurting innocents. And that actually makes for a pretty cool story for a D&D game. Imagine a wizard or cleric creating a golem to protect her people or her city who then loses control of it. Maybe she's killed trying to destroy it. And now the city needs heroes to bring the golem under control. Perhaps in some sort of iRobot scenario, the golem is actually carrying out a perversion of its previous orders. Perhaps it's protecting people by imprisoning them to keep them safe from harm, so it's basically become a kidnapper. Or it's protecting a particular subset of the population by murdering another social, religious, or racial group. And maybe some of the folks are actually on its side. After all, a golem is only as good or as bad as its creator, and a golem is an extremely powerful weapon that is extremely difficult to control, and it's resistant to most of the magical tools its creators could use to control it. It's basically a magical, self-directed nuclear option, just on a more limited scope. I am become Elminster, destroyer of worlds. And we could talk of Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, the novella by Mary Shelley that speaks of a depressed scientist creating a golem made of dismembered corpse parts and invested it with life through the use of scientific truth. But to be honest, that story actually doesn't really fit the golem mythology very much, except in the most superficial ways. And besides, then I'd have to give the old speech about how Frankenstein was the scientist and the monster was the monster or Frankenstein's monster. But the people who make that argument obviously never read Frankenstein. Because in that story, Dr. Frankenstein was the monster. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.